you, Ben. And Ben's doing a good job in the lead. And we work together well. We thank the Lord for his blessing. It secures the continuance of the church for the next generation. Well, it's a privilege to be with you here. This is always special at the Green Cathedral. So talk to you young minds, sharp. You're going to remember everything I say, right? You have an advantage. Uh, <laughs> later on, the, the memory is the second thing to go. It's an old joke. And uh, anyway, we don't remember the first. Now, <laughs> I'm in Revelation chapter 1 tonight. And I know I'm, I'm biting off a lot as we see the description of Christ and his glory. And my wife said, no, it's too he heavy for these young people. And I don't know about that. I think with your young mind, you have an advantage of retaining. So if, even if you get part of this, uh, then hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. You know, in the Old Testament, you have certain ones who saw the glory of the Lord. And Moses, you know, he's a couple of times up on the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights, and saw the glory of the Lord. And Moses still requested, Lord, show me your glory. And he said, no man can see my face and live. And then you had Ezekiel. I'm studying teaching Ezekiel right now. And Ezekiel saw the similitude of the glory of the Lord. It's pretty awesome if you know that book because God has a chariot and underneath are the cherubim and on top is a throne where the Lord is. And that vision of the glory of God is what maintained Ezekiel in a very tough ministry. And if you know that book, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple and that did happen. But then the glory comes back in Isaiah, I mean Ezekiel 43, who is that that comes back in the millennium and uh, once again fills the temple? Anybody? Jesus Christ. And Ezekiel says, And it was like the glory that I saw by the river Chebar in the beginning. So that was Jesus Christ back there in Ezekiel chapter 1. So I motivated with my recent studies to share this with you. I'm reading a book too by uh, John Owen on the glory of Christ. So let me give you the setting a little bit, but let's, let's read our scripture. And again, I know this, I'm biting off a lot here. <laughs> and uh, I want to pray God would bless this to our hearts. You know, it really doesn't hit home unless the Holy Spirit shows us the things of Christ. So let's, I'll read this in uh, Revelation 1, 9. I, John, who al also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's persecuted, he's exiled, very fruitful Apostle, the last one to live. And this is a very rocky, desolate island where he was. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet <clears throat> saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. I'm not going to read all those. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine bronze, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, 
I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in this book and that you've shown this to us. We know uh, we can't fathom the depths as we heard last night. We just It's the tip of the iceberg what we understand and what we can comprehend and envision of the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the I Am the Alpha and Omega. But we ask for your Holy Spirit's help and that this would open to us. And bless this group. Bless these young people. We thank you for them. And we pray for your blessing on them and through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, John is in a desolate place, but we see the Lord opens things up to him in a marvelous way. (laughs) In this picture... Of the Lord Jesus Christ and so I want to go into this a little bit now you want to realize that you you can't really picture this in your mind I don't think that that's the point of it to um, in some way uh, realize visibly this has been uh, artists have attempted to paint this but the point is there's some symbolism here you know there's not literally a two-edged sword coming of his, out of his mouth but the Word of God is a two-edged sword and that's just one illustration some of these things I'm sure as much as human language can describe of his hair being white and his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet burning in the furnace and his face like the Sun as much as human language can describe that that's what he looks like but I'm sure it's much he is much more awesome than what we can consider. Now you don't want to think of Jesus like the paintings of Jesus. Kind of an effeminate, good looking guy, you know. And uh, <laughs> Jesus, oh, I th- he, he was a man, he was a strong man. I mean, you look at what he went through in the scourging and the crucifixion. But there's no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. There's no halo around his head. But we don't know him after the flesh, right? That's not what he looks like. (laughs) And as we heard well last night, he's God manifest in the flesh. Now let's think about this a little bit. He's always been God. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the eternal God. It's right here in this text. He's the I Am. And in the fullness of time, he became a man, born of a woman, the incarnation, supernatural, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary didn't have a human father and so as a man he was sinless and that made him eligible to be our savior to take away our sins but here's the amazing thing the word in the beginning was the word you know it the word was with God the word was God same was in the beginning with God and the word was made flesh that word made means became he permanently became a man So the God of heaven who created the heavens and the earth, who has no beginning and no ending, united himself with humanity. That's what we have here. We have the God-man. But we don't have him in a a human form, uh, in the, uh, pardon me, in a, we don't have him as a a lowly Jesus where his deity was veiled. We have him like on the Mount of Transfiguration where momentarily, it was similar to this picture right here and Peter gives a testimony about that we saw the coming glory of our Lord Jesus Christ he he saw what he's going to look like when he comes back in a second advent now you realize there's the rapture that's imminent that's where he comes to take us home and we meet him in the air he takes us to the place that he's prepared but when he comes back to planet earth <laughs> in power and great glory this is what he'll look like and when he comes to that temple in the millennium that's going to be built for Israel this is what he looks like he'll be in a glorified state 
And so this this is Christ for eternity. And, and don't you think, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, that the one that took on him the form of a servant, became a man, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Don't you think that's even a higher exaltation than what he had in the glory with the Father before the world was? And I believe so. Because he's the Lamb who's glorified. You know, it's interesting. The name of Jesus, uh, who, well, I ask you, what, what is the most prominent name of Jesus in the book of Revelation? Anybody? I sort of hinted to you. The Lamb. The Lamb. That's right. One time he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And you see him as the judge. He's the one that opens the seals. And he, he's the one that's judging the world in the tribulation time. It's fitting since he was the one that was judged for our sins. But he's called the Lamb. And forever we will remember as believers and we're in heaven that he's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And he's got those glorified wounds, so to speak, in his feet, in his hands, in his side. We will never forget. Uh, and that's, that makes him all the more glorious. And that's, that's reflected in this section too. We'll get to it. But as we look at this, you want to have a reverence and mainly we want to get the application of this description and what I'm driving at especially though is verses 17 and 18 that's where I want to spend the most time but it, those don't mean anything unless you go through <laughs> the description here verses 12 through 16 so so hold on with me and I've got the references we're going to look up and some just refer to he starts out and notice uh, he says in verse 11 I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last and of course that's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet and please go with me to the book of Isaiah I probably am overlapping with Pastor Aaron Jaffe and Isaiah chapter 44:16. And of course this all goes back to your memory verse Exodus 3:12. But notice Isaiah 44 in verse 6. Very important. He says, "Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no god." That's the significance of that. He's the one true God. This is the true God in eternal life. 1 John 5.20 And while we're in Isaiah, uh, please go to, let's go back to chapter 41, verse 4. There's another application of this. 41.4 says, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and the last. I am he. So he's a creator, and he's also sovereign. Let's go to chapter 48. One more here, Isaiah 48, 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called, I am he. I am the first, I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens when I call unto them, they stand up together. And then he goes on. And so, he's the creator. He's the consummator. <laughs> he's the beginning. He's the ending. He, he initiated it all. He's going to consummate it all. So he's the Alpha and Omega. Now let's go back. You might put your marker there. Revelation chapter 1. He goes on in uh, verse... Verse 12, he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. I'm just going to touch on each one of these. There's about ten points here, so hang on. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the candlesticks, he tells us later, are the, are the seven churches. And, and note, a candlestick gives off light, right? <laughs> 
and he's he's in the midst of them uh, and that's that speaks of Christ's preeminence and his presence but as you know the memory verse I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life the church is the light right we're light in the Lord but who is the light the light is Jesus Christ whom we're to shine forth I'm going to move along bear with me here and again he's in the midst now you know that's what makes a church a real church a church <laughs> in first Timothy 315 that was read last night the church the local church that's the context is the house of God the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth it's the house of the living God there's an unseen guest in fact you could go farther than that a time like this the believers here where two or three are gathered in my name I will what he's in the midst and that's an exciting thing we want we want his presence with us don't we and when he gave the Great Commission he said lo I'm with you always even unto the end of the age you know if you've got the presence of God with you that's all you need and so Jesus is in the midst he's in the midst of the churches he's in the midst of his people and going on quickly he's called the son of man now that's from Daniel chapter 7 where the son of man comes to the ancient of days who's God the father and receives the title deed of the earth and and he is the Messiah that's really the thought behind that any Jewish scholar would know that and Jesus referred to himself many a time by the Son of Man and and of course it does refer to his humanity but much more than that in fact when Jesus was on trial and they asked him are are you the son of the blessed he said yes from henceforth you're going to see the Son of Man coming in power and glory and uh, just like it's predicted and so and this is how he'll come and the next time the Jews see Jesus of course it says in Zechariah 12 10 they will see him whom they've pierced but they'll see this one whose face is brighter than the Sun and they'll mourn for him and they'll realize we crucified our Messiah he's the Messiah the Son of Man and hold on and next we see in verse 13 B he is clothed with a garment down to the foot now this speaks of his majesty and his greatness really it speaks of his deity and and I won't turn to it but Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah saw a vision of the glory of God he he saw him and he said his train filled the temple <laughs> that's talking about that garment and by the way that was Jesus Christ because in John 12:41. Uh, it refers to Jesus glory and so it's amazing you consider who Jesus is now in retrospect consider this you know when Jesus was crucified they stripped him they beat him scourged him and then he carried his cross went to the cross they divided up the garments they gambled for the one woven garment and that was the that was the garment that he had in crucifixion and he had a crown didn't he the crown of thorns in many respects that is the most glorious crown because that's a crown of his grace and his love Hebrews 2 9 that Jesus became a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death he by the grace of God should taste death uh, for every man and, and he's crowned with glory and honor but that's his garment in heaven it's the garment of deity and majesty and now the next one notice it says at uh, 13 at the very end he's girded about the paps with a golden girdle now this is probably best explained by turning to a passage in Exodus 28 4 Exodus 28 4 and this is describing the high priest of the Old Testament and I'll give you a hint Uh, 
28, 4. And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, and a mitre, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. But all that is a picture of our great high priest in heaven. Because that's, that's who he is and who bears us on his heart and who carries us by his strength and that's the that's the book of hebrews we have a great high priest this is the sum of the matter who's seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens who sympathizes with us who intercedes for us and who knows our every need and customizes his prayers for us just like he did for peter but let me move along and notice next in verse 14 his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, when you think of white, you think of what? You know, when a bride comes down the aisle, typically how she dressed in white. It speaks of purity, of holiness. Jesus is holy, harmless, undefiled separate from sinners hebrews 7 26 he's called the holy one but the white the hair white as snow it does speak of his eternality also and then next notice his eyes were as a flame of fire now please go to psalm 11 on this one the eyes speak of intelligence and speaks of his knowledge his omniscience in Psalm 11 4 we read the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord's throne is in heaven his eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men so Jesus with those eyes of a flame of fire he knows every heart he knows every thought he knows every word. <laughs> Psalm 139, he knows our uprising, our down sitting, uh, our thoughts are far off. He's the omniscient God, but you can't help but think with those eyes of fire. <laughs> He's ready to judge sin. This is not a light thing when you consider who he is. And that's also descriptive in Revelation 19:11 when he comes with the armies of heaven. He's got the eyes of a flame of fire. And he says in John chapter 2 that Jesus didn't commit himself to any man because he knew what was in man. Well, Jesus knows all men. He knows each one of you. He knows if you've trusted him or not. And so he's the omniscient God. When he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know all things. <laughs> and Peter knew that about the Lord. And so, you know, we... We ought to uh, realize uh, all things are naked and open before the eyes of him uh, in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, verse 13. Next, we see he has feet, in verse 15, like unto fine brass. Now in the Old Testament, and notice as if they burned in a furnace, uh, the altar where the sacrifices were, was a brazen altar it was a brass altar and you remember the the serpent that Moses put up on the pole was speaking of also judgment and of course that speaks of Jesus who took our curse if you look to him who was judged for you uh, you'll be you'll be healed in your soul and so Jesus is the judge is the point in fact John 5 22 says all judgment has been committed to him it's fitting isn't it the one that was judged for our sins is the judge everyone will stand before jesus and it was brought out last night every knee will bow everyone will confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god he's the judge he'll he'll judge the church at the bema seat he'll judge israel he'll judge the nations he's the judge and so his feet as fine brass as in a furnace and then notice it says as in uh, verse 
15b, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now please go to Ezekiel 43. I mentioned it earlier. This is where Jesus' glory comes back to the millennial temple, the thousand-year reign of Jesus. In Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 2, And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Now, if you've ever been, especially to the Atlantic Ocean, you know, maybe even during a storm, and the, it, the waters are hitting those rocky shores, <laughs> there's a roar. You know, that's the thought here. And it speaks of his omnipotence. His word is all-powerful. Jesus' word. And later we see there's the sharp two-edged sword. Again, speaks of his power, the effectiveness of his word. Please go to one more, Jeremiah 25, 30. Jeremiah 25, 30. You're getting the point, right? That Jesus is very great, that we don't know him anymore after the flesh, that he's, it's not the, not the meek and lowly Jesus that's portrayed in the Gospels. Don't get me wrong. He still has those characteristics but he's almighty God and that deity is totally unveiled <laughs> and it will be forever in uh, Jeremiah in chapter 25 verse 30 therefore prophesy against them do I have it right all these words and saying to them the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Back in Revelation 1. Continuing in the description. It's very awesome. And notice verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now that's it's described who they are. The messengers to the churches. You know the seven letters in chapter 2 and 3. And I believe that would be the pastors. Uh, the ones that are conveying the truth of the word of God. He's got them in his hand. And that's a picture of his sovereignty, but also his protection. And that's a good place to be, in the hand of the Lord. And then finally, last but not least, in fact, the greatest thing of all, because his face is the essence of who he is. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So this is a central feature of Christ, his brilliant glory. And the Apostle Paul, you know, on the road to Damascus, he saw a light brighter than the sun at noon, <laughs> and it blinded him. And even there, though, I don't think he saw, he didn't see the essence of this. He didn't, no man could see Jesus and live. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 16, he dwells in light that no man can approach unto, no man can see. He's so great. If in our mortal state we came in the presence of Jesus Christ, we would die. No question about that. We wouldn't be able to handle that. But thank God, as believers, when we do come into his presence, and we will, and we'll react like John, and we're going to see, we'll have an eye that'll see him. We'll see him as he is, for we'll be as he is. Not Almighty God, but in conformity to his image. We'll have an eye that will be able to behold him. So, you know, these things are way beyond <laughs> what we can comprehend. But God's revealed this for a purpose, so I want to share this with you. And I have more confidence in, than uh, what my wife said. She's a good teacher. She's almost always right, you know. When you got a good wife, you do want to listen. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm assured that this could be a benefit to you. And we want, to, we want to see Jesus, right? We want to have a right view of him. And, uh, and 
we'll we'll only see him like this when he's in his glory. Let me before we before we get to uh, John's reaction here and Jesus' reassurance. Can you see Jesus today? Anybody? Is there a view that God gives us of Jesus? Have you in his in his word? Yeah, he's revealed in his word. Didn't Paul say in Second Corinthians three eighteen we we behold the glory of God, and he tells us in chapter four verse six that's in the face of Jesus Christ. It's not with the naked eye, no. It's like Moses in Hebrews eleven twenty seven. He saw him who is invisible. It's a look of faith. There's a reality to that, brethren, and young people, all of you. you. We want to see Jesus. We want to be like Moses. Show me your glory. We want to have that view like Ezekiel that sustained him, who had a difficult ministry to the captives of Israel and Babylon, and it kept, kept reoccurring. You know, that's where, that's where his mind was, no doubt. We, we want to be off looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. We want to be occupied with him. Hebrews 3, 1, consider him. And we've heard a lot about distractions, <coughs> all kinds of distractions. You know it's all cheap stuff <laughs> compared to this and compared with seeing Jesus by faith. I like what, how Vernon McGee put it. I want to know the reality of Christ. And, and I believe he did, if you ever read Vernon McGee. <laughs> and uh, he had a gift of being able to convey. He's a real scholar, but could convey it in an interesting way. So God wants us to see him. He wants us to see Christ's glory and to have the high view of God. And that will change us. That You know, it forever changed the Apostle Paul. He's willing to go through all that suffering <laughs> And uh, it motivated him. It's like the prophets of the Old Testament. They had that, like Isaiah. He saw, he had that view of the Lord. It motivated him. We want to have it. And and so it's something to look for, to pray for. And um, when I was saved, uh, everybody else gave their testimony. I'll give my testimony for what it's worth. <laughs> um, I was a first generation Christian. And I was on the wild side, motorcycle, beer drinking, party loving, young guy. And uh, and I wanted to go to OU. I had friends there and it was a party school. That was my motivation, pretty bad, huh? And so <clears throat> on my way down, there was a cross on the way in. <laughs> it said, get right with God. <laughs> Two weeks later I was, didn't even see it coming. I was a senior in high school, 1970, and in, in the fall, and and it was. Uh, and don't misunderstand me. I grew up in a good home, had good parents. They were married almost 68 years. They weren't saved till the end, <laughs> but uh, and you know, grew up in church. They thought I was a good little boy. You know, I had one of those bards. Went to Sunday school so many years in a row. <laughs> I had kind of a head knowledge. I wasn't a good boy, and <clears throat> but that day. I was reading in the Bible and realized that the Lord Jesus is living. This isn't just a story. And he loved me and he died for me. It became personal. For me, it was like meeting him. And not that I saw anything, you know, but uh, with the mind's eye and uh, by faith, but didn't really have any good guidance until my sophomore year at OU where I came to a Bible class taught by Pastor Harlan Oswald. <laughs> he, he preached Christ. And you know those were the, uh, have you ever seen the movie Jesus Revolution? I recommend it. <laughs> I witnessed it. I was actually part of it. And, <clears throat> and so uh, they came from all sorts of backgrounds there at OU. It, it was a real revival not just there but universities throughout the country and he didn't say anything about people's dress or anything like that he just preached Christ and lives are transformed it was something else God has spoken in son <laughs> he hear ye him 
that's where that's what we want to see we want to see jesus and anyway when god gets a hold of you and you realize who he is and you have a relationship with him it will change your life it's not just some profession you know i believe in jesus and then there's no change that's not the real deal no there is repentance there's a change of mind where you realize you're a sinner you need a savior and there is the personal trust in him who died for your sins and rose again and then it's instantaneous simultaneous you pass from death and into life you become a child of god it's the greatest miracle under the sun it's the power of god that that gospel message you know we're, we're praying for you if you're not saved <laughs> that god would get a hold of you <laughs> and uh think about it and uh that god would open your eyes or if you are saved you'd have a higher view of the savior be motivated don't mess around <laughs> you remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come i live at a condo association when we're all old i'm one of the younger ones my neighbor's 95 he worked for walt disney he did the voice for mickey mouse and uh anyway <laughs> uh and they're all facing the end and you get together they talk about all their ailments <laughs> don't wait till you're in your uh upper uh, age to serve the Lord, you know, serve the Lord with the vigor of youth. Anyway, rambling too much. I want to get back to the text here. So, John saw this great vision of the Lord, and and then notice his reaction, verse seventeen. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now, you've heard people say, you know, there's the false teachers. You want to be aware of them. I was taken up into heaven. I saw the Lord. No, they didn't. They're lying. <laughs> and uh, But John did, and he fell at his feet as dead. And why? Because of his greatness. And, and he, but now notice, uh, by the way, when he came to Abraham, Abraham fell on his face. He came to Ezekiel. Ezekiel fell on his face. The disciples, Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, they're on their face <laughs> this this is the typical reaction to come in the presence of the lord and so and then in fact in matthew 17 7 if, and for time i'm just i have to refer to most of these he he put his hand on them and that's exactly what he did here he says he laid his right hand upon me now that's a hand of reassurance that's a hand of acceptance. He saw Jesus in his greatness, but it's okay. <laughs> and if you have your faith in Jesus Christ, as great as this is, the holy God, who is the judge, there's nothing to fear. So there's a hand of reassurance, and then there's that word, fear not. And you know, that's 366 times in the Bible one for every year, even a leap, leap year. Fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. Isaiah 43, you go through the waters, through the fire. Fear not, again, I'm with you. It's all you need. You know, if you, you remember Moses, he wanted the Lord to go with him through the wilderness after the golden calf incident and and uh, and God, in in answer to Moses' request, he says, "I will, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest." And Moses said, "If you don't go with us, don't send us up from here. <laughs> it's all you need." And uh, but fear not. I was going to branch off on this, and it would take too much time probably. But did you know people have a lot of fears? And we could probably go down through a list of what of what the fears are, and so uh, it might be out of the context a little bit. But if you see Jesus and you have His hand of favor, and you hear His fear not, and you know He's with you, there really is nothing to fear. And when you have God, if God be for us, who can be against us? You think about that now. And uh, th those fears are, it's like a little kid that there's something in the closet, you know. <laughs> I mean, 
and uh, most most things that people fear will never happen and uh you, you probably, your mind's probably already working oh yeah I, I do fear this and i do fear that <laughs> well fear not when you have his uh, you have his hand on you and you have his favor because you've trusted jesus christ even when you die Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even then, nothing to fear. He'll lead you through that valley and receive you on the other side. Well, there's four reasons here that he says not to fear. And that's what I want to dwell on. You, you said I could go over, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go a little over. Five minutes? Oh, man. Okay, Ben. We'll try. Uh, he says, <laughs> notice here, fear not. I am he that liveth. Well, I'm the first and the last. There's the first one. And I'm going to make applications here. Why not to fear? Now, the first and the last, he's eternal. But he's also the one who's the initiator and the consummator. He's the author and finisher of faith. And he who begins a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Fear not. He's going to complete his, pardon me, his work of grace in you. You know, it's hard to preach after those big meals that they give you. And, uh, and so, fear not. <laughs> and uh, you may wonder, how am I going to run this course uh, when the Lord is working in you? He's He doesn't do anything incompletely he's the alpha and omega he's the beginning and the end he's the consummator he will finish what he started in your life believe it <laughs> fear not and then secondly he says i am he that i am he that liveth and was dead now that means he's the redeemer Christ, you know it, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Romans 8, 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, that rose again, that's at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. <laughs> and so, fear not. He's redeemed you. There's certainly nothing to fear. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I am redeemed. I'm saved. And uh, I remember Pastor Ospo used to drive 70 miles from Chillicothe. And like most preachers, didn't have much money. And he'd drive his, he'd drive the big Buicks until, you know, the tires were bald. Well, one time <laughs> there was blacktop, fresh blacktop, you know, and it rains, the oil comes to the surface and shoo, off the road. And he brought a man, Leroy Zeisler. He was a real prayer warrior. Their heads went through the windshield. That's before the shatterproof windshield. And he says, you okay, Leroy? Yeah, Pastor. I'm glad I'm saved. <laughs> and the car was total, and they didn't really get seriously hurt. But if you're redeemed, you it's okay. <laughs> Whatever you go through, yeah, it's a great thing, isn't it? And then the next one is, he says, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Now, that's, that has to do with the fact that he's our advocate in heaven. It says he's there in the presence of God, literally before the face of God for us. Hebrews 9, 24, he's your representative. You're accepted in him. And also, he ever lives to make intercession for us. Again, it's a customized prayer. He knows exactly what you need. We're not conscious of it, but we have that promise. And then the last one here, last but not least, he says, Amen, and has the keys of hell and of death. Now, he's sovereign. You know, our times are in his hands. Proverbs, I mean, Psalm 31, 15. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And that's up to him. He's got the keys. That means he has the authority about that. I had a doctor. I've had metastatic prostate cancer um, 15 years. I had a doctor eight years ago tell me, you probably got three months to live. Well, here I am. <laughs> And so it's all up to the Lord. I, I have zero PSA, if you know what that is. Anyway, fear not. I got the keys of hell and of death. By the way, you will never have to fear hell. 
if you have your faith in Jesus who took your sins and he did die for your sins don't miss heaven you you don't want to be in the lake of fire you don't want to be in that place where you're condemned forever and ever in outer darkness weeping and gnashing of teeth that need not be and Jesus has the keys he took the sting out of death by his death for our sins and resurrection and so isn't this an awesome picture of the glory of Christ and his majesty he's the great I am he's eternal he's the first the last he's the creator the consummator he's the redeemer he's the living one he has all authority but if you trust him you have nothing to fear if you don't trust him you have much to fear and I had a funeral one time for an eight-year-old girl had spider tumor in her brain you know death has no respect of persons now she was wonderfully saved and in uh, Pittsburgh Children's Hospital the last thing she says was I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus face <laughs> but here's the thing you could die anytime and don't die without Christ don't die in your sins <laughs> doesn't have to be fear not and through faith in him you can trust him you can know him you want to bow the knee to him reverence him and have his hand of reassurance upon you you are accepted by him let's pray father how we thank you for this picture of jesus in his glory we know we don't we can't do justice and our minds are so limited to comprehend it but we believe it and we know he's awesomely great the Alpha and Omega the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory and someday we'll see him in his glory we pray for each of these souls here today father you know them you the omniscient God and so work in their hearts to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ such a simple thing to know that he paid it all nothing to do with our merit everything to do with what he did to take away our sins the redeemer the lamb of god as great as he is he was willing to stoop so low to be crucified in our place and so we give you the glory for our savior in jesus name amen